<laughs> Hi again, Trevor. Hi, sorry about that. Got to turn this phone off. <laughs> so, hi again, everyone. Uh, this is the second in a two-part series on building 50-meter pools. And uh, if you went with us yesterday, we were talking about championship pools. And today, which is probably more interesting to most people, we're talking about community pools and trying to persuade others to help us build 50-meter pools. Uh, this is often very difficult, uh, but that's what we're trying to do. So. If you have a 50 meter pool or if you're looking for a 50 meter pool, is it going to be a outdoor pool? That makes it much, much easier. But, you know, you might have need a building uh, around the pool. This is probably the simplest and easiest type of building you get, a fabric structure. But if you're in a northern climate, you need a structure that's um, got insulation within it, like a sprung structure, or you're looking to build an indoor pool and then you'll have to partner and find some serious partners. And this is a high school pool in uh, Indiana, uh, which uh, was sort of created by the local swimming community, persuading the local high school to build a first class swimming pool. So, you know, there are many different uh, options that we'll be talking about uh, to try and help. And we've got some good guests with us also to help us. Yes, and yesterday we kind of had, we wrapped up the session with uh, Clément Manchon from Chaban. And um, today would be, the, this is kind of the perfect tie-in to the discussion today with 50 meter pools with it amidst uh, more community purposes rather than the competition purposes that we discussed uh, yesterday. Yes, uh, Clément's uh, presentation was uh, excellent and uh, if you didn't see that, you can actually look him up on the website, look up the presentation. This is a pool in France, which is a, he won the competition to build, it's in construction now and, and it's an absolutely fabulous uh, facility. Now, when I was doing some research for this, pro uh, this program, I ran across this article from Sport England. It's about a um, it's about a project in Mount Kelly College in Southern England, and it really is a nice document that you can probably find on the internet. And if not, you'll be shared shared this presentation. Um, if you uh, what really is nice about the presentation is it was um, it was a comment by the headmaster. Who said before we um, before we were building this, we were looking at who would be using it, and he's particularly delighted with the uh, close working relationship they established with the community and the local and regional swimming community because sixty percent of the usage is by local swimming clubs, primary and secondary schools, not by the school itself. Yeah. But when you go through the document here you see some absolutely fabulous information. Um, and here is a breakdown of all the costs that they entailed in actually building the facility. So these type of things are on the internet to help you. Plus, we'll be talking, of course, today with some experts who can help you. Yeah, and today we're continuing with a, a nice diverse group of guests again. Um, we have representatives from the US and today the UK and we're going to start with the Isaac Sports Group. And we have actually Stu Isaac, whose company specializes in feasibility studies to help local authorities and also swim clubs in deciding what size of facility they can afford or what they should build, and how, what they need to include to keep the facility running, of course, for years and years, uh, keep the cost down as well. Um, and Stu should know what he's talking about, Lani, because he was a former great swimmer at the University of Michigan, worked for many years for uh, Speedo before setting up his own company in consulting on pools. So if he doesn't know what he's talking about, it's, it's, a, poor, it's a poor story. Yeah, uh, definitely he's got great credibility. And I, I just also want to mess, uh, mention Isaac Sports Groups also works, um, builds the fe feasibility study to provide strategic and tactical support in developing partnerships and securing the support of funding uh, for aquatic centers. So we're going to welcome Stu. Hi, Stu. Hello, Lonnie. Hello, Trevor. Thank Hi. you for uh, inviting me. Thanks for coming. 
So I entitled my comments today as winning the 50 meter pool battle, because as you heard yesterday, you know, there are lots of times where you really have a 50 meter pool that's dedicated for a championship or really has that focus on specific championship or competitive purpose. That is not always the case. In fact, in 90% of the times, it's not the case. So the first thing I always encounter are perceptions from the overall community about what a 50 meter pool really is. And these are the things you have to overcome in the process. We all understand that in the swimming community, but we've got a large group of people that don't understand what we're trying to accomplish. And within the swimming community, you've got to understand if you're trying to promote a 50 meter pool, how to address these issues. And the first thing that always comes up is a 50 meter pool is an elitist luxury very small percent of the community really needs a 50 meter course. I'm not a swimmer, I'll never use the pool. How do we overcome that? It doesn't provide, the perception is, it doesn't provide the community's recreation needs. It's again, it's competitive only. Many that want fitness, warm water, it's too cold, I can't use the pool. You wanna host events, but all that seating that we use maybe 50 days a year, that's just wasted space. I'd love to swim laps, but the swim team's always taking up all the prime time when I want to swim. And of course, the bottom line, it'll cost a fortune to operate. We can't afford it. The bigger the pool, the more money we lose. If we go to the next slide, we're going to talk about that. One thing I often tell clients is that when you really lead and always stress, I want to build a 50 meter pool, it just reinforces that perception of elitism. I tell some clients, don't even use that phrase 50 meter pool. What we can really sell to the community is we're building a pool with 16, 25 meter or 25 yard lanes. So we have plenty of room for lap swimmers and masters and community programming. Just so happens it may be 50 meters wide, but again, it changes the focus of what you're trying to pitch. Really like the ability to stress that and downplay and really downplay as your lead that elitist use of a 50 meter. Recreation, well, new ten trends in rectangular recreation are very important. Let's stay on this slide for a moment because we also have fitness and warm water. It is virtually impossible from a community perspective to build just a 50 meter pool. You really need to have that warm water. It can be a small space teaching pool. This is a teaching pool in the picture that is adjacent to a 50 meter pool I'll show you later. But again, handicap access, stairs, ramp, but it does have 25 yard lanes that can be used as warm up lanes for the 50 meter. So again, addressing that community need. And then let's go to the next slide because I call it rectangular recreation. You'll see more examples of this with water tech, to be honest, later in the program. But you've got to stress to your entire community, the people you're building support, that a 50 meter pool is much more than just competition and training. These are examples of all the things you can do in a 50 meter pool. Upper right hand corner, that's a zip line in a pool. Same pool that has wibbits, has a slack line. You see the guy walking the tightrope. That zip line, that was taken out of the pool in 15 minutes and the lane lines were flipped and it was back set for a 50 meter training session. All these things are critical in what I call rectangular recreation. If you flip to the next slide, all the seating goes to waste. Well, I, we addressed this. In fact, Steve Crocker, who will be on later, helped that was part of this project team. This is again, that same 50 meter pool in Tupelo, Mississippi. And you can kind of see in the left-hand picture that there's a blue area, kind of a solid area. What that is, is in the seating, half the seats are retractable. I often see retractable seating for competitors on the deck to make more deck space, but decks are wet. They're not all that functional. This is in the actual seating elevated area. And you can move that back and we have a great almost 2000 square feet of additional function space, training space, program space. There's even power in the floor below the seats. So all the kind of things you, again, do to make your facility much more flexible and much more community friendly. This next one, one of the great Mirtha products 
innovations over the last uh, really almost a decade. This is, uh, of course, a pool in Zurich. But we talk about that flexible space for that lap swimmer, for the master's program. This is that split movable bulkhead where you can figure at the same time 50 meter and 25 meter courses with a move the movable bulkhead that has the lane lines flow through the bulkhead. If you go to the next one, this is a design study we did in conjunction with water technology for a pool in Ontario. And you can see we have our five 50 meter lanes, five 25 meter short course training lanes, but also a community program element. We also have a movable floor at that point. So again, we're utilizing the 50 meter pool for much, much more than just competition and training. Stu, yes. Clem on yesterday. Uh, he talked a lot about the other aspects of uh, amenities in the pool. So, do you ever get into involved in um, restaurants and uh, other activities that go on alongside the 50 meter pool, or are you just focusing on the tank? We will definitely focus on the entire facility. I would say definitely more than half of the aquatic centers, if they're really community-based, will have fitness components, will have functional meeting space. At the minimum, we have a catering kitchen that can support meetings, event hospitality, um, social functions, birthday parties. What I would stress is that you have to look at the entire facility. You cannot build a lot of those amenities without a robust daily membership that's using all the facilities. If you want to support, let's say, daily concessions, a pro shop, a Zoom shop on site. And then you have to have a pretty large event capability if you want to really have, again, a robust concession or sales program built around events. But these are all part of it. One thing we try to take into account is all the elements of that, not only an aquatic center, but so many of them becoming really community rec centers or community meeting centers, even if they're still just called the aquatic center. These are all things that not only enhance the value to the community, but significantly enhance your ability to balance the budget. So, which is a good segue into it costs a fortune to operate. When we're dealing with communities that may have a public mission, I always ask when they say, our pool has to be sustainable. The aquatic center has to be sustainable. Well, define sustainability. Some, as a, being in business for decades, sustainability to me meant turning a profit. That's not always the case in communities. Sustainability may be you're covering your operating costs, but understand that you need to have low cost swim lessons, low cost membership for the, your residents. So you may have to give free pool space to the high school or other local club programs that you understand that's part of your mission. So you can sustain a loss, but it's justified by what you're giving to the community. So understand for your client or the project what is sustainability and what is the goal? The first step is lowering expenses. And you'll hear more about it. You may have heard more about it yesterday and all the technical support that goes into this. And certainly that's lowering operating costs by lowering electrical costs, water costs, natural gas, heating costs, all through state-of-the-art technology like I've pictured, regenerative media filters, UV systems, very smart web-based control systems, variable frequency drives. I talk about this because long-term maintenance and replacement is a part of this. And certainly the Mirtha Advantage is a great asset here because of significantly reduced long-term maintenance costs, replacement costs, repair costs, resurfacing costs. We have often done independent studies to help analyze the that delta and the savings long-term for a Mirtha versus traditional construction. But it's very important that when you talk about this, it's an integrated story. We don't just talk about the mirth advantage. We talk about it, what you can save in mechanical systems, state-of-the-art technology, water reduction, all the things that are driven by the state-of-the-art infiltration, controls, heating units, lighting, everything. Because you really got to, again, as I said earlier, think of it as a whole integrated story. 
and then you can apply best practices. The next slide gives you a little bit more about raising revenue, the other side of making your pool sustainable. I made a, one of the challenges up front was the bigger the pool, the more we lose. That's not always true. Your goal, whether you're trying to decide on a event 50 meter, a training only 50 meter versus a 25 meter or 25 yard pool, the revenue is very important to truly understand. Often a 50 meter lane is much more valuable and much more in demand. Often having that critical mass of long course training lanes creates a whole different financial model as well as the opportunity for events that may make the bigger pool much more cost effective per square foot. Your revenue opportunities significantly increase per square foot. Ultimately, your warm water pool may be your single biggest revenue source when you think of uh, uh, revenue per square foot or per construction dollar. One thing, and I mentioned it when I referenced fitness, if you have a 50 meter pool and you have other pools in your systems, maybe another aquatic center, often people say, I don't, I'm fitness, I'm using more warm water. If you move out your training from those smaller pools to the bigger pool, what you're really doing is opening up significant space for more community-based programming in the other pool. Don't neglect the impact of a new 50 meter on all the other pools that may be in your community or city park system or in the facility itself if it's a multi-pool facility because you often have significant community opportunities in your existing pools that are created by having a 50 meter pool for more training and more the big water type facilities. That is a really critical component of the overall aquatic financial model, not just of the 50 meter pool by itself. Stu, on, and, that, and, yep. on that basis, would you always recommend a second pool with a 50? So that you Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes we have clients that come to say, well, we want a 50 meter pool and we may talk for 10 minutes and they already have caught on that. No, we need that second pool. Okay. If you're going to run events, you need a warm up pool anyway, if you're running 50 meter events. But to make it financially viable to build your feeder programs to support community activities, you've got to have a second pool with differentiation in water temperature, depths, and it may even be a third if you add the therapy and wellness component. Okay. So always invest in expertise and experience. Don't skimp on your management because that is, I've seen a lot of well-designed pools that fail because of management and invest in marketing. Don't shortchange those just like you don't shortchange your tank, your air quality and your water quality. So next. This is the pool I've been using, uh, Tupelo. This is a community of about 40,000 people in Mississippi, not traditionally a hotbed of swimming, but they had a community initiative with public, uh, private support from the local club team, a great 50 meter Mirtha pool here. This had the retractable bleachers. It has a great outdoor sun deck. You can see in the back where the, uh, the warm up pool is. I showed you with the ramp and stairs. So really the example of an incredible community asset, this pool was actually voted the top new tourist attraction in the state of Mississippi the year after it opened because of what they could do in events. And yet it was so integral to the community and the programming. And there were partners. You can't see it on the wall, but the teaching pool was funded by the Elvis Presley Foundation. Since Tupelo is the birthplace of Elvis Presley, it's the Elvis Presley teaching pool. So uh, a great community effort, but a game changer in competitive aquatics in Mississippi. 40,000. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, I wanted to just wrap up by saying, be an educated owner. If you're the client for somebody doing a feasibility study or for the architect and, and the, the consultants that you'll hear about later in aquatic design, there are feasibility study challenges. Be specific and detailed in your goals of the study. What questions do you want answered? What analysis do you need? Question your potential partners and stakeholders in what they would like you to address. Too many feasibility studies are a template that's cookie cutter. You've got to make sure you're asking what you want to know. 
macro studies using national averages versus market specific detail can really lead you down a bad path. Make sure it's very local, locally oriented, but draws on national best practices and trends. Understand that local competitive training and event market. You often, and that includes sport governing bodies and what user groups would commit. You often know these things better than a feasibility study consultant. Make sure you're not shy about bringing what you know in the market to your consultant. And finally, please do your own homework. You utilize the resources you have. These MRTHA programs are fantastic resources. MRTHA pools is a great resource. The other people you hear from today are great resources. USA Swimming has a build a pool series. Swimming Canada is running a series of uh, facility webinars. So there are a lot of resources out there. Trevor mentioned what you could find of that study from the UK. So use this and do your homework. Don't expect your consultants or your feasibility study provider to answer these questions. You really need to be an educated owner. So any other questions, Trevor and uh, Lonnie? Stu, you, you wowed us. I mean, you're really making Maine and Trevor's show up very easy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, if it were only that easy. <laughs> that, that was a super stop, Stu. I mean, for people who are looking to try and uh, build a 50, uh, certainly so many things are in that presentation, and we'll be sharing that with everyone, so don't worry. And yeah. uh, I'm sure Stu will uh, be pleased to talk with you if you contact him Absolutely. directly. Thanks a lot, Stu. That was Thank great. You so Thank much, you, Trevor. Stu. Thank you, Lonnie. Thank you. Wow, that was great. It was great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now moving on to 2521 and our viewers probably remember this one because uh, we, we were our guests on our second discussion with Learn to Swim and we hope to have them back today um, to chat with us about incorporating a 50 meter versus a 25 meter within the community pools. Yes. Unfortunately, they were unable to join us, but we'll, we'll go over this quickly yes. for the well, viewers. For those that don't know, the 2521 was... Uh, program developed by the Dutch Swimming Federation, which is really unusual because they found that their clubs were being pushed out of the local community swimming pools and other programs going in meant that the water space wasn't there that they felt they needed. And so this was a program to help swim clubs get involved and build their own, own clubs. So they, they work with a local architect and um, this is um, the, one of the first pools that they built, the uh, 2521 uh, pool, which gives you an idea. Most of the products that they use are prefab. Uh, the first pool was open. Uh, they started in 2009, talking about it, and their first pool was open in 2014, which is absolutely remarkable. Very impressive, yeah. Very impressive. And uh, they've built five pools now in uh, in the Netherlands, and they've also built another five pools throughout Europe: uh, Germany, uh, Belgium, uh, Norway, Poland, and so on. So, a really interesting program. They have a they have a project for 50 meter pools, but they've been far too uh, successful in selling their aspect of 25 meter pools with, with low financial um, output. You know, they're building pools for about 4,000, uh, sorry, 4 million, 4,000 would be great, 4 million euro, but they have low maintenance costs, low energy costs, low personnel costs, because it's based on using a lot of volunteers from the swim club and the swim club community. They've got fixed income because they work with the local schools and everyone to make sure that they know the income that's going to use and they can have predictable expenses for the following year. So if they have to make it up from somewhere, they've got plenty of time to make that up. But their 50 meter uh, concept is really good, very similar to the 25. The bulkhead you see, movable floor you see, but as I said, the 25 meter pools have been so successful because they incorporate all of that into the uh, one project. And because most of their projects are predominantly uh, pushed by the local swimming community and 
50% of the time run by the local swimming community, helped, of course, by the local right. authority, yeah. um, they're, they're able to build uh, an awful lot of these facilities. There's the basic design for a 25 meter, and this is a photo of the same project with another very interesting variable on pool design, and that's a flip up wall that goes the length of the pool and allows warm water and social activities on one side and swim training on the other side. So we wanted uh, we wanted the guys from 2521 to share some of this with you, but you can find them on the website. Lots of useful information about building the pool, about operating the pools and so on. Uh, but they're essentially a prefabricated building and pool. So uh, really, really low down and make it affordable for swim clubs if swim clubs are trying to build. And I know many of our architects and uh, consultants joining us will do the same locally. Uh, this has just become very popular in, uh, in, in Europe. Yeah. Okay, and moving right along, our next guest, um, we talked to Mark Galridge of GG3 Architect, Architect, uh, Architects, excuse me. Architect, I'm sorry, I'm living in Italy. I'm just kind of losing my English a little bit. <laughs> Uh, GT3 has developed a reputation for creativity and innovation, uh, supported by a proven, tr proven track record in translating concepts into a successful project delivery. Trevor, how about you continue the introduction of Mark? <laughs> Mark's a great guy. We met him a long time ago when he uh, worked for um, a company um, in London. I'm just, just lost now, Mark. What's it called? Is it, where is Mark? I'm here. Mark is here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> so, uh, Mark uh, worked with us um, a long time ago. Um, I remember touring a pool with you, Mark. I remember you getting down on your knees saying, This is not a stainless steel pool, banging the wall of the pool, and then saying, Wow, oh, that's very good. That's it. Inducted. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, it's over to you. Uh, I, I you. Presentation. It looks excellent. Let uh, let the people. <laughs> if there was ever a drum roll, it's um, the uh, yeah. I, I know we we sp I spoke with Trevor two or three weeks ago about his presentation. And said, well, you know, what, what is the audience? And, you know, we we I think we've got a lot of people on the webinar today are probably um, embarking on looking at a new facility. Um, the conversations and the presentations that have just had a, a, a kind of core to, to how we design buildings and a lot of the flexibility that you was talking about is absolutely paramount to where we believe our industry is going at the moment. So we um, we wanted to focus on this presentation around what are the current using standard swimming pool design. Uh, and I'm going to break this down to four elements of this presentation. One is about the brief. Uh, about spending enough time in developing the right brief. Uh, and then actually concentrating on how um, we continue to build pools just like we have done over the last six years and things have got to change. We've got to start thinking outside of the box. Uh, and swim pool in terms of flexibility, some of that has been touched on uh, just now with some of the earlier presentations, but principally around what we call universal design. And I'll explain what that is shortly. And then finally, certainly in the UK, and we've got, um, thankfully, the experience of working both in the UK and internationally um, with Merthyr. Uh, and I don't think carbon neutral targets are alien to governments and councils alike across the globe. And really, our legislative designs need to catch up with where passive design and carbon neutral targets are going. So I just want to explore some of that as well. Not going to dwell on this slide. I think people have probably seen this slide before in, in some presentations, but this is really about the design brief. And you can see some of the images there about, I'm sure, any client that have developed building leisure or non leisure about how getting the brief right is so important. And you can see some of the clashes there from contractor to engineer to opening the doors of the building, the perception of what we're actually getting. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, we need to make sure that 
we, we see so many times um, how people's perception of a brief is an accommodation schedule. The amount of people that pass the brief and say, here's the list of facilities, that isn't a brief. We need to spend the time in terms of embarking on probably a leisure facility and a swimming pool and everything that Stu has just mentioned there about spending the time before we even get to feasibility stage around developing a common goal, uh, a vision, uh, and spending the time and resources in doing that. Um, we need to make sure that we've got the stakeholders. So Stu was mentioning there about uh, operators. We need to know what our demographics are looking like, about who we're actually reaching out to to make sure that the, the, the needs of the stakeholders are met. That's not just a facility mix, that's their vision, that's their ambition. So we don't start going halfway through a project and finding these people come out of the woodwork saying, my pool's not long enough, my pool's not wide enough, I need more flexibility. It's absolutely crucial we get their needs met in the report early on before we even put them. And then, you know, a brief, how do we measure success? So we do all these great 50 meter pools or 25 meter pools and build all of this great flexibility in. How do we know whether that project is a success? You know, cutting through the red tape and making some snappy photos at the end, that isn't success. Success is about making sure we've actually met the brief. And that's why it's so important to get that right and build this flexibility in from the start so we can benchmark it at the end. And then making sure that the motivations are aligned with those of our clients. So do we know what they actually want? How many times do we ask the question of our stakeholders? What is good for you? What does good look like? We just seem to kind of use our own expertise and just fly away and start designing without asking the fundamental questions of, do you want a 25 minute pool? Do you want a 50 minute pool? What is good for you? Get those motivations aligned first in terms of a brief. And then finally, just next slide, Sylvani. And I think this is just a question, really. I mean, of everybody that's on the call today, how many project briefs are developed as the project progresses? Um, there where people do come out the woodwork, where we've got to retender, where costs have got to be realigned, or value engineering has to completely re just realter the whole perception of the building. Get the brief right, that will not happen. Uh, and our process is through what we call performance plus. Take about two to three months to actually develop the right brief, but every performance plus strategy document that we've delivered has met projects on budget ahead of time and meet the aspirations of those clients. It's fundamental. So that is the first bit, and this is all about performance plus. And I'm not going to dwell on this slide today, but I think links to our website will kind of link you into our performance plus process um, and show you how that brief uh, is written and how to do it well. So the, the next bit is about thinking outside the box. This is about um, when we embark on these pools, and as I say, we have, we have the privilege of designing pools around the globe as well as in the UK. And we have the, and we, we are, we are, we are you know, caught up into this trap as well, but most architects get caught into this trap about designing buildings that we have done for the last 60 years. Um, and some of these points that Stu mentioned, spectator seating how many times do we build fixed spectator seating where these things are used maybe once or twice a month at best yet take up huge amounts of space where this can be space that is allocated to gym use studio use exercise space get that flexibility built in um we also put in the amount of pools where we see pool covers put in if you actually look into pool covers and anybody that's embarking on a pool today just have a look about, A, what is the cost of the pool cover? Why are you actually putting it in in the first place? Now, most people think that you're actually trapping heat and it's actually storing heat overnight, etc. and that's why we do it. What pool covers actually do, in actual fact, at night, you're actually lowering the temperature anyway. So the actual savings you get over the lifetime of a pool cover are at odds with actually what you save. I think the other thing that people don't realise in the work that we're doing in our passive design is how much bacteria is actually fed back into water through pool covers where you've got stagnant water that's just hanging there so we're actually re-evaluating now through the use of moving floors and working with Murphy closely about how we can address the need of pool covers without actually spending it just for the sake of it the next one is about tiles uh, you see the bottom shot there on the right 
the amount of times we actually go into building pools with tiles, building supports around with tiles, building changing rooms with tiles. One of the key callbacks after we've actually built a pool, mainly from the contractor, is that my tiles are dirty. Why are my tiles just remaining filthy like the bottom right? Picture there? Why are we constantly cleaning? Yet we still put tiles in. Um, yet you go to other facilities where they're actually changing the game and taking tiles away and putting more asphalt material down there. Yeah, in the UK, we still take, take tiles down every single time and it's, uh, it has to change. The next one is filtering water. Uh, we'll come on to that with the passive means, but over in the UK especially is that we still adopt dam filtration as the usual first base, which takes sort of huge amounts of space of pool filter, uh, filtration rooms. Headroom needs to be much higher in terms of the volume to lift these things out with hatches at minimum 3.7 uh, meters. Uh, and they take up a huge amount of space. Um, yet yeah, there's so many products on the market now that are changing the game in terms of how filtering water is much better. So we need to adopt new principles around filtration. Also about the use of concrete pool, as um, we were asked by Murtha um, about 12, 12 months ago now, Trevor, that yeah. there were some key questions coming out of both clients, contractors, cost consultants. Why, why are we using Murtha? What, you know, is it not more expensive? Does it, it, does it take longer? Uh, and we were getting all these mixed messages from different types of clientele. We were asked to do an independent report on the Murtha versus concrete. And without, I, I urge you to kind of have a look at that document really as an independent feature because what it actually showed is, is that it is cheaper. Um, the program time of concrete to, to Murtha is about the same over about over, on a standard pool tank over about a 45 week period. But the difference is there's about a 16 to 17 week gap in the middle, which you don't need to, as a contractor, don't need to staff that, which means that you're saving on prelims. There's big cost savings there. Uh, and we're, we're developing with Murtha some new technology now that makes that even more rapid. So I urge you to have a look at that. But that, that is actually changing the myth actually that concrete is what we're all used to but it doesn't have to be the norm um, and that document kind of spells it out and then the final one is about utilizing roof space you know we designed these um, these pool facilities with huge flat roofs huge space bolted ceilings or or flat roofs above but we never utilize that space outside uh, and we're now starting to address that as well so one of the things that, um, and, and I know in America, universal design um, is, is much more ahead of the curve than, um, than, than many other countries, but certainly we're taking time now to how the space is used, going beyond accessibility, um, to look at designing a facility that's accessible is one thing. Designing a facility that's got universal design as an audit goes way beyond accessibility. Um, there's only one facility in the world um, that actually does universal design absolutely on the nail, uh, and that's a place um, called Mary Freebed. It's one of the YMCA buildings. Um, and again, it's worth just having a look at that about how they do it well in terms of color uh, around the facility, in terms of accessibility in pool facilities, as well as some of the dry space as well. Um, they look at the, the building biology, um, which is the principle of focusing on air, water, and lighting, uh, which is something that's very new uh, in design. Uh, and building biology principles really focus, certainly in pools, around that water quality, about the, the TDS levels in pools and about how it's filtered. Uh, and then the final one is about how we actually improve acoustics. Now, anybody that's embarking on a new facility today use it universal design as an audit. And if you use the universal design as an audit, even if it's just for the pool facility, you can be assured that what you'll do is go way beyond universal design and it doesn't cost. It's not, it doesn't come with big capital cost expenditure. It's just good practice. Now, this is um, passive design, certainly in the UK. Um, I said at the start, most councils in the UK are now coming head on into the eye of the storm of meeting what we call carbon neutral targets. Now, I can't believe that governments around the world are not also embarking on the same principles about how we can get more lean and green and environmental but meeting those carbon neutral targets. We're now starting to design facilities in the UK um, that 
apply passive credentials. Now, this is a big game changer with pool design because we've always kind of gone from the Bible of pool design when, for example, we design a pool, basic north, certainly in the UK, because it means that we're facing away from the sun, there's no glare on the pool, um, lifeguards love it. But the problem with that is we're designing a space that's heated to anywhere between 32 to 34 degrees in temperature. So surely what we should be doing is actually facing it south to actually benefit from that solar gain to lower the energy demand on that pool. So things like that are completely changing how we go about designing pool. Filtration, for example, we're now starting to apply microfiltration in most of the pool facilities that we now do. Uh, microfiltration takes up a fraction of the space uh, that you normally find with scan filtration. Um, I think the comment there that swimmers typically consume a pint of water in a 45 minute swimming lesson. Think about the bacteria, the levels of TDS solids in that water. If you can purify that water, take away that smell of chlorine from the water, you can arrive in a facility where chloramines are not in there and it's broken that down. That's got to be a good thing. And I think microfiltration is certainly one of those uh, technologies that I would certainly recommend you look at. Um, it's just better water quality, smaller plant room space, no attenuation on the water, smaller balanced tanks, big capital savings. Um, the other thing with passive is about plant is that we become more zonal. So rather than having big lumps of plant in the corner of your building, we now create zones for plant around the building. We improve the air tightness of our facility, which is completely alien to what we, where we used to be in terms of naturally ventilating spaces, not so much pool, but the rest of the facility. Air tightness is increased massively. Um, we increase humidity of the pool um, in terms of the pool atmosphere to reduce the amount of water that evaporates overnight, uh, and that saves huge amounts of energy. Um, and we find in that, you know, passive, and it depends on what the facility is, but you get passive design right, you're going to be send, saving circa 200k i mean i'm talking pounds here so you can convert that uh, on a typical pool facility which is an eight lane uh, 25 with learner pool and it could be above that right? um, that's a minimum so some huge savings on what is just changing the way we design our facilities from the start well mary that was very detailed and uh, incredible presentation thank you it's like wow yes <laughs> so much information there uh, Mark, um, being in North America now for the longest time, we don't hear the word brief, right? We only hear this terminology of feasibility study. Uh, from what I, I gathered at the beginning, uh, if you're going to do a, a comprehensive brief, do you then need a feasibility study or is that the same thing? No, it's very different. I think people... Um People just embark straight into feasibility studies. I, I'd imagine that you know, if we've got a host of people on the call today, I'd imagine they're looking at if they are embarking on a, a new pool facility. One of the first things they're thinking in their head, I need to instruct someone to get on with a feasibility study. Does it fit on my site? Does it does it answer the council brief? That is the feasibility study. What we're saying is there's a process that should come right before that, um, which is you get designing get the brief right, meet your stakeholders, make sure, are we designing a 50 meter pool here that's ultra flexible or are we designing two 25s or a smaller pool and a 25 in the case of pool facilities. But meeting, spending time getting that right is absolutely fundamental to the project. And the, the money that you spend just to escalate in that period of time that you would ordinarily spend on a brief, uh, as we call it over here, you save in spades further down line in terms of the time savings and program time and cost um, in terms of messing about with people that come out of the woodwork and value engineering, et cetera, et cetera. So spending that time is invaluable and in getting that process and finding a team that understands how to write the right brief. That might not be a designer. That might not be your architect. It's, it's, it's making sure that the team that you assemble to write that brief have the credentials to deliver and have that client and stakeholder engagement as core of their business. It's, uh, I think some really useful information there to our listeners and uh, thank you very much, Mark. That was great. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for joining us. No problem. 
Okay, Trevor, now moving back to your side of the pond, we uh, welcome our final guests of today from WTI. Um, and we are lucky to have the president, Doug Whitaker, join us as well as Walker. Trevor, I'm going to ask again that you do a, a detailed uh, introduction. As, so well, as a budget. In, in the USA, for sure, and around the world in terms of water parks, WTI are known everywhere. In fact, you know, they've been part of six of the top 10 uh, water parks rated in the world. They've been part of the design process. So uh, they're certainly well known in the industry. They're also well known certainly in Canada and the USA for their work on community pools and competition pools and so on. Uh, they've got Steve Crocker, who you mentioned, is a former world record holder in swimming. And he works with Doug, uh, leads their sports uh, swimming division. And uh, he's going to talk to us about one of the projects that they did recently. And I, uh, I don't mean, mean to steal your thunder when you're on there, but he, he persuaded a community with a budget of $32 million to build a pool to end up building a $72 million facility. <laughs> usually completely the other way around in the industry. So you're yeah. a magician, Steve, and uh, your company, WC, is a great company. So let's go. Well, hello, everybody. This is Doug Whitaker, and I'll kind of start out. And and uh, uh, one of the things that, you know, WTI is known globally for water parks, sports swimming, and community pools. But like we've heard earlier, you know, the start of a successful pool begins with uh, a brief, a program establishment, and a feasibility study. And what that does is it really helps understand the owner's goals and objectives, you know, how to maintain the long-term attraction appeal of a facility, how to align the program with the budget, or like Steve was talking about, you know, maybe, maybe to uh, get the right program, they need to expand the budget. Durable operational uh, uh, understanding is very important and how, how, how we establish the correct cost of operation. But everything that we're going to do to establish a successful project really is about maximizing guest use for this facility. And, to, and that is because every time you come to it, you have a memorable experience. Now, we've collaborated with Mirtha on... Gosh, Trevor and Lonnie, I, I don't know the exact number, but it's well over a, I can't even think of how many hundreds of projects that we've done together, both in the water park market, the sports swimming venues, and community pools. And again, they're successful because of the steps that have been talked about previously. Um, one of the projects we're kind of showing right now, this was kind of a, a response. This is in Windsor, Ontario. And this was a, a value engineering response, a, an innovative one, where we the initial design had a 50-meter um, uh, pool with a, a separate diving well for platform diving. And when we started looking at the budget, they had a finite number. We had to figure out how we could reduce the space um, saving, or you know, the space here. So what basically we did, we put in a 15-meter um, a, a uh, diving well. We actually used a 15 meters for the uh, warm water pool, and it's actually multiple temperature. So there's Mirtha and WTI collaborated on coming up with a thermal bulkhead that would separate the water temperatures. We have separate circulation systems and a movable floor. So now we have a movable space where we can create um, up to five to six degree water temperatures on different sides of the pool using the same water. And so now you can see this kind of great programming where you can have lap swimming and all sorts of uh, um, important things going on in the 50 meter pool or the 25 meter pool. And we can have, as you can see on the right hand side, we can also have um, a water exercise class with warm water where people are doing water aerobics and uh, or warm water lap swimming. So it really provides that uh, multiplicity of program and unique usage to being able to provide a, a great facility that's successful for the operations of the community. 
And this just kind of shows a few of the considerations that we went through with multiple bulkheads and uh, you know different locations. And I'll let Steve kind of take it from there. Well, Doug, before Steve starts, I just want you to know that yesterday when we were doing the uh, championship pools, we mentioned Windsor and we mentioned it because Paris 2024, their permanent pool, as we would say, is almost a copy of Windsor. So congratulations. Uh, we probably great job there. Well, congratulations to all of us because it was a collaborative effort to kind of to come up with a great idea that met all those needs in a cost-efficient manner. Trevor, when we when we look at pools like this, it's really important to consider early on all the different course configurations. Sometimes the quantity of bulkheads is a, a very very important conversation. Some of your, some of the viewers today are probably su will be surprised to hear that in the U.S., as the only country in the world that still competes in 25-yard courses, the, the the course layouts can get quite complicated, and sometimes it can mean adding a bulkhead just for that for that course layout. So yeah. go to the next slide, please, Lonnie. This is the this is one of the Olympic trials that was was in Omaha. Everybody is somewhat familiar with this. It's a it's you know just a fantastic way to do a venue, and, and these legacy pools have just taken over um, high level competitive swimming. Some of you might may not be aware that this is just the primary pool. There's another 50 meter L shaped pool uh, in another part of the building, and Mirtha has been really really successful at finding permanent homes for these for these pools after the trials. And we've been really, really fortunate and, and have loved our relationship with Mirtha to, uh, to work on the kind of the, the final home. This is the SWIM RVA facility in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, it's one of the trials pools. Uh, it's, it's now 25 yards wide. It's interesting that in the US, many pools are 25 yards wide instead of 25 meters to allow more flexibility by swimming in that cross pool uh, configuration. This pool is, is the, at, at the entrance to the facility. They proudly display all the Olympian, all the Olympians that swam in it, and and all the world records that that this facility broke. Excellent. So, go to the next one. This is the second pool, which, as as Stu was saying, this is critical critical for the success. This is a six lane pool in a separate space. Uh, it's also a Merca pool, shallow, warmer water, and this uh, this. It's used for a pool during 50 meter meets, but most importantly, it's a revenue generator. All their wellness and instructional programs take place in this pool, and it really, really has been successful for them. Is that 25 me 25 yards? Uh, 25 yards, correct. So this is the Halbert Aquatic Center in West Fargo, and uh, North uh, Fargo, North Dakota, and. Unlike the, 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 this is the 2016 trials pool. And what was great about this was Murtha sold this pool well in advance of the Olympic trials. Because of that, as we worked with Murtha to design it, we were designing this pool for its final configuration as well as its Olympic trials configuration. So this pool is also 25 yards and it's longer than it was in the trials because it now includes two, uh, two meter bulkheads. Um, you might find it interesting that a lot of the pools that we do, even 50 meter pools require some shallow water. So a lot of the, the high school pools, for example, that, that are 50 meter, we use an, a, an unusual configuration where the two ends of the pool are deep and we'll do some shallow water in the middle of the pool. And that way you kind of create three different pools in one. It's that you create a diving pool at the deep end shallow water in the middle between two bulkheads and a deep water short course at the at the other end so that's a unique thing that that we commonly commonly uh utilize um so steve this is doug i just wanted to also insert here this that was a great collective effort between mirtha isg Stu, and Dwayne helped on this and wti to really work with the community to develop this program like you said, that it could be they could purchase the training pool well or the um, trials pool well in advance, and it worked out very good. And I believe, Stu, this still maintains a very uh, a great uh, um, success story with the community. 
the the course you see here is is kind of kind of unique in that it's it's a short course, 25 yards centered on the spectator uh, uh, seating zone. So you can imagine that when you're starting off a bulkhead like that, located mid pool, it has to be a, a, an oversized, very large bulkhead, and that's what you see here. This is this is a wide bulkhead to allow for all the all the athletes mid pool. The next one is the Elkhart Aquatic Facility, the Elkhart Health and Aquatic Facility. It's a very large facility, and it really consists of two separate. Uh, aquatic facilities that operate that can operate ind independently in the near in the near side you see the competition and training pool it's a 65 meter pool and it's 25 meters wide through the glass on the far side you can see the health wellness and instructional pool and there's even a, a, a little pool spa in there um, this again as as uh, this is the one that that Trevor mentioned it, it the budget went up significantly and and honestly Stu Isaac had a lot to do with this he was kind of the matchmaker that got all the all the entities together there's Beacon Health that, that is a big contributor they actually run this facility and they have series in northern Indiana of other facilities that are similar in terms of health and fitness the school district is involved there's two high schools that use this uh, at the same time the Elkhart Community Foundation, the city of Elkhart, and there was even an endowment of, of, of about $10 million to support the operation of this facility for, for, the, for the next 40 or 50 years. It's got two, two oversized bulkheads. You can see that the diving, they went uh, many, many plummets with one meters and three meters and even some platform diving. So they can support uh, club, club diving and prepare their high school athletes to, to, be, to dive in college and, and beyond. Um, and then on the other side of the glass, that's that's really successful. And, and the locker rooms and everything were designed so that when you're hosting a huge event uh, for competitive swimming, that other side of the of the facility, the health and fitness side, operates uh, with no issues. So this is this is a high school facility. It's about a 65 meter pool located in Louisville, Texas, near Dallas. And what's unique about, about the way they do pools in Texas is that this pool is used by five different high schools. If each high school, like, like the traditional approach where each high school has their own pool, uh, it's much more cost effective to build and especially to operate one large facility as opposed to five or six smaller facilities. So you can see it's got oversized bulkheads as well. It's got 1,200 spectator seats. This facility has been incredibly successful in terms of, of revenue generation for ho from hosting competition. In fact, they, they recently over the summer hosted one of the uh, international swim league competitions that was extremely successful. Steve, the, you're showing yeah. quite a number of high school type of pools. Are they the leaders of uh, the community to get the pool, or where, where is the lead for these fabulous pools coming from? The number one lead. They they pass a bond and uh, for the school district, and it, and they're they're completely built by school district funds. So the wow. public the public tax base pays for these facilities, uh, for the op, you know the, the construction as well as the operation. But one of the big selling points, Trevor, and one reason that the the taxpayers are, are very anxious to support projects like this is what you're looking at now. These facilities save lives. There's about 8,000 kids every year that go through swimming and water safety at this, at this facility. I think there's like 30 elementary schools that bust the kids over and go through, go through a series of, of instructions that, uh, that, perf that, that's performed at this facility. So this is a shallow normal pool as part of the facility. So the places in the world that are actually getting rid of pools, this is really a good sort of idea of, of how they can uh, uh, pressure for a similar type of uh, setup where all the schools go to a certain pool and all do their swimming there. Yeah, I think Texas was kind of a leader in that, and, and other states are following with that promotion of, of water safety at their, at their, at their venue facilities. But as, as Stu pointed out, you really need a second pool. You can't teach a you can't successfully teach a, a, a fourth grader learn to swim in water that's 80 degrees. It's uh, within minutes they're un, too uncomfortable to continue and be successful. 
This is an outdoor pool. This is a community in Walla Walla, Washington, and they they wanted a, a 50 meter pool. Their old pool had been abandoned for over 10 years. They wanted a leisure pool for the community, but they could not afford what they wanted. So by by working with Mirtha and using the rent of action, we were able to come up with a really creative idea on the 50 meter pool that it only cost about 60% of what a new pool would. The original pool was only 60 feet wide uh, and, and therefore offered no short course opportunities for the, for the local high school. So what we did is we bumped out and we created sort of an L-shaped configuration where a portion of the pool is 25 yards now. And we deepened the pool in two ways. We, we used the Mirtha Rent of Action to raise the water elevation, but we also uh, were able to, to deepen the pool by adjusting the floor contour. So this has been incredibly successful and, and, and there, you know, by using part new Mirtha and part Rent of Action, it came together flawlessly and well away like it's a 25 year structural warranty on the pool that was built in the 1960s. And one of the unique things about that facility, if we can stay on that for a second, is the fact they had tried to renovate this pool or replace this 50 meter pool for many years. And like uh, um, Stu talked about earlier, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of things go with how it's pre presented to the community. So when they were promoting this project, it was really not replacing it, but it was really renovating it. And when they became a renovate this pool, that for the Veterans Memorial Pool, because that's what it was called earlier, the community fully supported it, and uh, it was a it was a great project and continued to be very uh, uh, successful for the community. Some of the amenities, you know, again, these pools can be incredibly fun. Just because a pool is a large rectangle doesn't mean you can't have fun in it. You can see the Wibbit uh, inflatable structure. We also have a slack line, water basketball, water volleyball, and to the left of the screen is the is the new leisure is the new leisure pool. So, loads of fun when the teams aren't using it. And so the next image kind of shows a, an overview of a a very fun project that we did with Martha in Hobbs, New Mexico. And this again was a, uh, a great collaboration. The, um, this is kind of a success story in the fact that they wanted to have a 50 meter pool. We went through multiple programming exercises. And one of the things that ended up here is the fact that the community was gonna have to sacrifice other things in the uh, development of this very uh, multi-generational facility to be able to put a 50 meter pool in. And we started to do like Stu talked about, analyze the number of lanes that were needed and all of the things that were critical to the success of this program. You can see through this leisure pool, this, is this picture is actually taken from a walking track that circles around the facility. But you can see the, the leisure pool in the foreground. And in the back, you can see a great uh, 25 yard by 25 meter uh, pool that um, in, in, with a, a separation wall. So you have two different water temperatures, two different environments, and they can be used successfully. And so this kind of illustrates that very uh, a reverse shot of that, um, showing the um, the 25 by 25 pool, the spectator seating, and then up in the upper right hand corner, you can kind of see there's a lounge up there, so people can overview both of these facilities. One of the advantages of working out of your home, you get to hear the uh, grandfather clock go off every once in a while. <laughs> You know, the good thing is my dogs haven't uh, started barking. Presentation. <laughs> um, so anyway, what, when we start looking at what we can also do, and Stu brought up some really great ideas of how we make um, a, a rectangular uh, a recreational pool more fun and exciting, one of the challenges that have been with these inflatable things is how we, you know, insert those and take those out of the water. One of the new developments is called like a ninja cross, where you actually have a superstructure that spans the pool so you can lower it very quickly and then raise it up. So this really becomes great for friendly competition because now pool users are, are compete, <laughs> competing against each other to use this, but it's also kind of a, a water gym, an aquatics gym where people can do water exercise and, 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 and again, it, it helps activate that 50 meter pool. 
You push a button and it's gone. <laughs> wow. That, that was just fantastic, guys. I mean, thank you very much for using a lot of Mirtha pools in the presentation. But we have <laughs> a lot together as well, haven't we, Doug? So that, that was good. But we I mean, really have Trevor. And, and, and all of those pools that we're showing are Mirtha pools. I, uh, I think uh, for the people looking in, you've shown so many options and so many additions that people have to consider when they are building a pool. And, and if they want to build a 50 meter pool, obviously there's even more consideration towards these type of uh, things. This last, this ninja thing's fantastic. <laughs> love, love to be playing on that. Yeah, boy, why didn't they have that when we were playing in pool, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know what? The, um, some of this is kind of a result of uh, David Marsh's, uh, you know, when, when you look at some of the pools that uh, David Marsh has created, he has kind of uh, this uh, somewhat of a similar idea with some of the things that uh, he uses to motivate his athletes and help build their different muscle groups with pull-up bars and rings and things of that or over the pool that again, you, you get those competitive swimmers and they have get competitive in everything they do. So they're racing each other to try to compete that. So there's a lot of synergy to this kind of a consideration. Yes, yeah. absolutely. The swim coaches can come up with some very uh, surprising uh, methods. <laughs> of so, yes, this is uh, excellent, excellent. Listen, I want to thank all of our guests, Lani. Uh, this was a nice, varied presentation from everyone. And uh, I think we'll give them, uh, the people watching some really good ideas and some really good information if they're pushing their local council or if they're dreaming of building their own 50 meter. Yeah, definitely. And thanks uh, to WTI for joining us as well, as well as all the other participants today and yesterday. I mean, some great information. Um, and today was it was very nice, Trevor. We they kind of made it very very easy for us. Yeah, very easy for us. Yeah. No, uh, but uh, covered all our subjects and uh, all of our questions. Yeah. So great work. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for inviting us. It's, it's a pleasure to share. Thank you. Okay, so Trevor, that brings us to the end of our two part session. Hopefully, the one next month we can maybe be in the same place again. Really enjoyed it. It's a it's a pity we didn't have um, questions from the audience because uh, probably most people don't know that they can ask questions throughout the presentations. But uh, there's certainly lots of answers and certainly probably raised lots of questions, and they should know that we and our guests uh, are available to answer those questions down the road. And the people have wrote to me, I will be getting back to you tomorrow. Um, it's been a little busy the last couple of days, but I will be returning those calls. Thank you very much. Thank you, thanks Trevor. Thanks Lani, good to see you again. You as well. Maybe we will meet again sometime. I'll keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> Bye.